So, so in John 17, Jesus prays that we would be one um, so that the world would believe that the Father sent him. And, and he, he clearly goes on in that context to say, I'm not just praying for the people that are here. I'm praying those that will believe on, on uh, their word. So based on that prayer, based on the fact that, that Jesus said, uh, you know, I, I want them to be one so that the world will believe, how do you see the importance of unity today? What, what should that mean for us as Christians? Well, certainly the scripture has been around for a long time. But the fact that we've not really walked in true unity, uh, becoming one means we've got to step out of our comfort zones, out of our individual thinking, and realize that to fulfill the great commandment and the great commission is that it's, it's different parts working together, praying together, serving together, uh, seeing how we can support one another, uh, that becomes a very powerful testimony to the community. The community is not coming into our churches. So somehow we've got to get out of the little fortress where we're safe and we feel secure and where we have control. And so to fulfill uh, what Jesus is prayer, I mean, we all have prayers that we're waiting on God to answer. Well, he, that's his prayer. He's waiting for us to answer and respond to that we would be one. So what does that look like? And perhaps we can talk a little bit more of how we've come to discover what that looks like. And the results is phenomenal. So, so what do you think it looks like? Oh my. <clears throat> well, it looks like us stepping out of our comfort zone of being an, in control as leaders. And I really think a, a part of my ministry has really focused on, on leaders because I think that's where the biggest problem lies we, we we're endeavoring to protect that which we have built up to a certain point uh, whether we're trying to protect uh, some doctrine and uh, of which is important but it doesn't fit in the total so uh, we have to get out of that mindset so it's really a a, a, a shift in the in the thinking of, of a typical local church pastor or leadership of just thinking about self so, so how did that shift occur in your own life, would you say? You know, for me, it, it began when I united with other uh, pastors and leaders uh, to pray. That was not a part of my typical doing ministry. You know, I would pray, oh, God bless. Or often our prayers simply don't go much further than blessing for a meal. I hate to say that, but in leadership, uh, I, you know, I've been in, in, in pastoral ministry for some 40 years. And early on, I, that was not a part of my equation. I would pray, oh, God bless what I'm doing today and never really enter into an intimate conversation with him and then spend time listening to him. And I think a lot of what we think about, uh, what I've come to learn, you know, I used to believe in that, that passage of scripture that talks about where two or three agree, God hears and he answers. We're all familiar with that. And I used to think the word agree was like we agree that this couch is black or your shirt is green and mine is blue. And that's not what the, the original word means. The word agree comes from the word symphony. And so it began to shift my thinking. If we're going to answer the prayer of Jesus in John 17, we're not going to come to agreement because you may be colorblind, <laughs> or, or I may be, or our perspective is different. And so it's not about that we agreed totally on every doctrine. And so in answering his prayer is that we, we begin to move in, in, in our prayer and in our function in a, like a symphony. Well, what's a symphony? Why don't you tell me a little bit? What's, what, what are the components of a symphony? All different instruments, but all playing together. Exactly. And so we all have different gifts, different sounds, different passions. So where, we, where two or three are in symphony or in harmony, God hears and he answers. So we've been all independent. And so I was as well as a pastor for years, doing what I thought was best. Like the Apostle Paul, he was sincerely serving God as he persecuted the Christians. But he was sincerely wrong. And I think I was sincerely wrong as a leader, as a pastor, in the sense that I somehow felt that I could fulfill the great commandment, the great commission as one church. Well, it wasn't happening. But when I began to see the power when we would come together to pray and when we would pray 
a different passion would come from different leaders, a different emphasis, uh, uh, a different angle, like a symphony. But the symphony has a, a conductor. And, and for us, we would go away for several days to pray. That would all that we would do. That was foreign to me. And that really began to shift. I began to see the harmony that was coming out when we were not coming with our own agendas. We had a facilitator who would work with us to keep us on track that there was no teaching. uh, There was no subjects that we were coming with a predetermination of what to do. Uh, We were wanting to hear from the Holy Spirit and talk to to the Lord in such a way that... that, uh, uh, God began to move and, and the, the prayers were, were all of a sudden would, would, would complement one another. It wouldn't be dominated by one person with their hobby horse issue or concern. But it would also, uh, we, we began to kind of, there would be an ebb and flow of conversation with the Lord. Our scriptures that would come up and we could only read a scripture but, but, but no commentary on the scripture. So it left more room for the Holy Spirit to speak. And I was blown away when I began to see, probably in my first uh, pastor's prayer summit, was the how it, he just began to conduct things, and it was beautiful. And there'd be a, there'd be a time when all of a sudden we we all independently w- would begin to weep with being overwhelmed by God's presence, and or a scripture verse would come to light in a way that someone else read it that I've read that same passage for years. And all of a sudden, in that symphony, in that harmony, uh, it was just, a, it was beautiful. And you're talking in that setting, churches, pastors from lots of different backgrounds. Exactly. Yeah, it wasn't just the same, same uh, denominational group uh, that was diverse. I mean, it, you know, our movement in, in Sonoma County grew to probably about 35 different Christian, uh, Christ-centered denominations. So some examples um, of the different ones you're talking about. Well, you'd have Episcopal, uh, uh, Presbyterian, you'd have Assemblies of God, Baptist, I mean, an array of uh, diverse expressions. And, uh, I mean, it was beautiful. So for me, I began to see an experience because I slowed down, and we all did, and took a deep breath. And there were times of silence that sometimes we're in a society where we go in a mall, there's music playing, and something's always happening. And for us those times of silence and we were instructed, Hey, don't get nervous when it's quiet. We're here for four days and we're going to eat together, sleep together. We're going to pray together, hear the Lord together. And it was amazing how the Holy spirit of God moved in such a significant way without any of us thinking we had to take charge. It was beautiful. I, I, uh, I like the idea of the, the differing churches, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, people looking at things from different perspectives. Uh, I have said for a long time, you know, having gone into so many different churches, I've, I've ministered in hundreds of different churches all across North America, all different backgrounds, and I feel like we have this tendency to hold one another at arm's length. Um, the, the, the first time that I was ever at a Presbyterian conference, um, their their style of worship was so foreign to me from my background. Right. But their reverence for the Word of God was just mind-boggling. And the first time I was ever in a Mennonite church, um, you know, I've, I've never been in a Mennonite church before. This is just totally foreign to me, what's going on here. They started off, they were starting to move into contemporary worship, uh, which meant for them that they, they began the service with uh, a guy playing guitar and a couple of songs and three ladies backing them up singing. Uh, but then they did yeah. traditional Mennonite worship, which was four-part a cappella hymns. I had never heard this before in my life. I just sat there in the middle of the congregation and felt like I melted. It was amazing. And we have all of these different perspectives, and yet we have a tendency to hold one another at arm's length and, and, and refuse to, to, to interact with each other when we have so much to offer to one another. I think that's, that's a real shame, and I, you've seen that same thing. Sure. You know, God is so diverse, and he's created us with such different personalities, looks, uh, passions. And when, you, when we allow that to, to, uh, to blossom, and we begin to honor one another, it's honoring the bride. 
uh, and, you know, if we were sitting here chatting and, and, and your, your wife came in and sat down and I just totally focused on you and never acknowledged her, uh, you would be somewhat, as well as her, somewhat offended, I would assume. Yeah? Probably. Yeah. And then I think we do that. We forget that the other church down the street uh, is a part of the, the bride of Christ. And when we ignore one another and when we have attitudes, and I think that for me, a lot of when I began to interface on a more intimate relationship with other pastors, my judgments that had, that had come through whatever school of theology I had had or experiences I had had, those judgments were, were false. Some things, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be that we agree in that sense with everything. I don't have to play the flute like you play the flute. I don't even know how to play the flute. Uh, and that's not my favorite instrument. Uh, but when it fits within all of the instruments playing and the ebb and flow uh, of surrender, it becomes a beautiful sound. And you're, and you're drawn to that symphony, that orchestra of diversity. So when we were praying together, I began to see brothers who loved Jesus as much, if not in ways more than me. And it, and it shocked me, but it opened my heart to begin to look at the ways in which my, my judgments and my attitude w- were hindering the flow of the Spirit of God in my personal life and in my ministry. And I was blind to that until I, I connected with others. 